Getting more bang for your buck. We all want a good return on our investment. And why shouldn't we, as good stewards, been entrusted with so much wealth, make sure that we're getting a good return, a good investment out of the money that we put into the offering bags? This is at least as important as any other money that passes through our hands. So let's make sure that we get the most value out of it that we possibly can. This is a little bit frivolous, bear with me. Ministers get together and they talk shop. I had a ministers meeting this week, so this is sort of fresh. One person in ministry says to the other, you know, how much money do you give away? Uh, and uh, the first person says, our church gives a full 10% tithes to missions or wherever. The next person says, mm, our church gives 15%. The third person says, our church gives 100% to God. And the others sort of scratch that. How can you possibly survive? How, how do you keep the infrastructure running if you give 100% away? It's easy. After the uh, service is over, the pastor takes the collection and throws it all up to God. Anything he wants, he keeps. <laughs> Anything he sends back down to me, I keep. That's not recommended, by the way, as a, uh, a biblical model of tithing. Uh, but we're left with the question, how much money do we give to God? Now, I thought I was pretty well across most Bible doctrines, but I came to this one and I really hit a brick wall. How much money are, am I supposed to give to God? Is it supposed to be 10%? Is it more? Is it less? And so I thought, what better place to go than to the Bible to find out an answer? So come with me on a little journey and learn with me what I discovered about how much money I'm supposed to give to God. From the Old Testament. Wait, uh, look, there was more verses than I could possibly have imagined. So this is just a very, very small sampling. But out of the Old Testament, you shall do this. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get your wealth. Now, does that help in telling me how much money I'm supposed to give to God? Mm, you don't seem very enthusiastic about that. It didn't help me either. It, it said... God has given me this wealth and I should remember him. I should be grateful, thankful, and humble. But it doesn't tell me what I'm supposed to give to him. That's the Old Testament. You come into the Gospels and hear Jesus speak. And he, he's a bit more specific about giving. He says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, press down. But it doesn't say where I'm supposed to give. It doesn't say give to God. It doesn't say give to the church. It doesn't say give to the poor. It doesn't say give to missions. It just says give. So I'm still left with this quandary. How much money am I supposed to give to God? Go further into the New Testament and get lots of other instructions. And here's one of them. Each of you must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. I still don't have an answer. Am I supposed to give to God anything at all? In the middle of your Bible, in the wisdom literature, you'll have things like this. Honour the Lord with your wealth and he will bless you in return. But it still doesn't answer the question. How much am I supposed to give to God? For that matter, am I supposed to give to God? Is now the question that's coming to my mind. And you know what I found? Go on, have a guess. Have a guess how many verses I found that say I am to give money to God. A very round number. It's a big zero. Well, what's God going to do with my money anyway? If he creates heaven 
uh, if the streets are paved with gold, if you can create a whole universe out of thin air, or less than thin air, then he doesn't really need my money. So the point of giving is not giving to God. When you give to someone in need, don't make a song and dance about it. Here's Jesus again speaking. So giving in the Bible is not giving to God, but it's giving in a way that honours God, but it's very definitely giving to people. And I was really surprised. I expected God to be getting my money. Now, let's jump into our passage today from Philippians 4. Uh, it falls into two brackets. The first three verses that we're going to be looking at are really about money because the whole book of Philippians really is just a great big thank you letter for all the money that the Philippians collected and sent to the Apostle. And then the second half, the other three verses, is, opens it up a bit to give a slightly bigger picture on wealth more generally than just money. Let's jump into it. You taking notes? Here's the first full heading we've got. There are two. The first heading. Uh, smart stewardship is about people. It's not about money. The emphasis is on people because we're giving not to God but to people. Now, let's, let's break that up and uh, verse by verse. Smart stewardship focuses on the relational aspects of giving. It's relational that's important. Uh, it was good of you, says verse 14, to establish a partnership. So giving is about the partnership that we've got between the giver and the receiver. It's a partnership relationship. So it's not just, well, let's throw some money at this problem, this situation, this project. Rather, it's as a giver, I am entering into a partnership with the person who is going to be receiving this money. And it's not just money that we're giving in that case. We're not only giving our money, but we're also giving trust. I trust that the money I give you is going to be used wisely, faithfully, diligently, legitimately, legally. I'm giving up control of this money that I've got. So it's a real partnership that says you and me are in this locked-in relationship. And that's why, coming back to this verse I mentioned earlier, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. This has got to be a choice that you have. I choose to give and I choose to give this much in, into this person's life for it to be used in a good way. Not doing this under any reluctance or compulsion. I do it cheerfully because I'm in a partnership. I'm part of what's happening. I'm engaged in this. I'm not just looking for some loose change on a Sunday morning, but rather me as a giver and the one who receives are working together on something that's bigger than just me alone. So, when we do our giving, here it is, of the money that's in here, how are we going to distribute that in a, in a partnership way? Well, for every dollar that comes in through the offering bag, this is what becomes of it. The first 24 cents goes to operating overheads. You know, we've got to pay public liability insurance, the, um, the fire inspection stuff, the council rates, stuff like that. Even before we're allowed to open the doors and do anything, almost a quarter of our money has disappeared. So there's no ministry in this. This is just keeping the lights on, flicking the lights on in the first place. Then, the next part of our money, now, we're, now that we've cleared the decks, we're back to square one, we can start giving. 
by choice. And this is the money that we send to the orphans and the students in Myanmar. This is our tithe. Now, it should be a minimum of 10%, 10 cents in the dollar. At the moment, we're on track 12 cents in the dollar. A bit behind last year's um, end result, but we're still tracking well. The biggest single part of where our money goes is, guess where? Go on. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Well, it's embarrassing for me. I don't know how embarrassing it is for you. But in order to have a minister, uh, most of the money, nearly half, more than half the money, in fact, goes in wages and salary. We're a service industry in those big terms. And so something like 80% or more of most businesses, we're not a business, but think in those terms, goes in wages and salary. So it's no surprise. That's not the number you ought to be worried about. The number you ought to be worried about is the next one. And that's the fact that we are spending more dollars than we're getting. We're sending for every dollar we get, we're spending a dollar twelve. Now, how does that work? This is a graph you've seen every month. There's no surprise here. The, the flat grey line is what we spend. That's our budget. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's rain, hail or shine. We still have to keep the lights on. So, we spend that amount of money. The, blue line, the bouncy blue line is what we actually get and the red line is the average of the blue line. Now, if you were to... You know, now, forget that for the moment. Think about you. You go out and you spend money out of your bank account. What happens to your bank account? It drops down. What happens at the end of that month? The new month starts. Does the bank uh, magically reset your your bank balance so that you can spend again? No. You start at that, well, I've spent that much, now next month I keep spending and it goes down and down and down. So although it looks like the blue line is reasonably steady, under the grey line, unfortunately, that's an accumulating debt that we've got. And so this is what's actually happening to our bank account. Every month, that bouncy blue line bounces a little lower and where's all this money coming from? It's coming from Dorothy, who's still tithing from heaven. She gave 10% of her estate, $80,000 more or less, and that's what is keeping the lights on. Uh, so here we are at the end of the solid line. That's what our bank account is really doing. And the dotted line is a trend that we can expect. Now, I'm not suggesting that anyone else die in the immediate future, <laughs> but you may well like to think about tithing from heaven. <laughs> now, let's move on. This, the second thing that we're going to see, we're now moving from verse 14 to verse 15. Smart stewardship focuses not on the money, not even on the people, but on the spiritual aspects of what's happening. And here it is, even the apostle who's the recipient of that money says, you Philippians know in the early days of the gospel. It's not about in the early days when I turned up, it's the gospel has come to them and it's the gospel that's making a difference in the lives of people and why we are giving and, and we do giving too, why we are giving is in order to promote the gospel. Now, there is a legitimate place for working in impoverished, underprivileged areas, and the church is far and away the dominant player in providing care of a practical sort around the world. The Christian church leads that by far. There's a legitimate place to go with the gospel for providing health care. And century after century after century after millennia, it's the Christian church that's been at the forefront 
of medical care around the world to the saved and to the lost. There's a legitimate place to put education with the gospel and again it's the Christian church that has been since forever the leaders of education provision. There is a place for disaster relief with the gospel. Now the church cannot match what governments around the world can do but governments follow the media and the media very quickly tires of disaster X and they'll move on to the next sensation, the next spectacular, the next trivia. But it's the Christian church that stays behind and does the hard yards when the media has forgotten it and long gone. They're all an important part of how the gospel plays out in and through us. But smart stewardship focuses not on those, they're peripherals. It focuses on the spiritual because little boys like this grow up to be men who are going to lead their communities and their country and that's why scripture says above all else guard your heart for everything you do flows from it that's why the gospel is the priority because it is what impacts the heart and out of that out of the heart is going to flow change so out of the heart is going to flow people who are grasping for power or who know how to live in humility out of the heart is going to come a drive to pour money into armaments and the military or out of the heart is going to come a desire to build a community infrastructure. Out of the heart is going to come a, a greed that harnesses and diverts money to offshore accounts or is going to be a generosity that makes a difference in the lives of real people. No wonder scripture says above all else, guard your heart for everything you do good or evil flows out of that heart that's why the gospel has to be the priority for our giving more moving to the next verse smart stewardship focuses on the personal aspects of needs that are out there and so again the apostle says time and time again you met my needs not a need or not a spiritual need but my needs this is very personal because it's people who are taking the gospel it's people who are going to people in order to share what God has done and wants to do in their lives Jesus said woe to you Pharisees for very diligently tithe mint and rue and every herb that how can you tithe a mint leaf? But they were very diligent in doing that. Yet you neglect justice and the love of God. Yet you ought to have done those little things. But people are important and they need justice. They need love. That's where the gospel is making a difference in people's lives. And we partner with that through our giving also in caring contribute to the needs of the saints it's talking primarily financially but there's more and in addition to that seek to show hospitality you see this is very personal it's not just throwing money at someone saying go buy yourself a meal but show hospitality how are how you doing by the way inviting people home for lunch or elsewhere for that matter, wherever, wherever pizza is being provided. Where, and, and know who is to be the primary recipients. Go on, who is going to be the primary recipients of our generosity? The saints, 
The world is not going to look after the church as a priority. We are the family of God and we have a primary responsibility for one another. It's only the church that's going to give to the church. It's brothers and sisters in Christ who are going to care for one another. We are the ones. Yeah, look, People come knocking on my door, I'll give them a few bucks. But here is where the big dollars come because we are to contribute to the needs of the saints. That's the first half. Let's come into the second half of what we're doing here. Smart stewardship is about results, not returns. Results. I mean, what are the results? And, and how's that different from the returns? Well, return on investment is just... Um, Ray will fill you in on all the wonderful details and how to calculate it. it it's the basic uh, measure of how your money is doing. But we want results. And here in verse 17, not that I seek the gift, that's the financial gift, but I do seek something bigger than just money. There's more than money involved. And it is fruit abounding to your account. There's a record being kept. And God's keeping track of this. Now, you know the fruit, the fruit abounding and it wants to accumulate. God wants it to accumulate. The rest of us want it to accumulate in you as well. Uh, you've memorised those. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That's where you'll find them. So let me just bounce from that to a little a couple of other things. Jesus. Look at this. John 15. Upper room. The night on which he was betrayed. We've already remembered the Last Supper. Beyond the Last Supper, this is what he's going to go on and say between the Last Supper and the crucifixion. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you that you would do this, that you would go and bear fruit. That's what he wants from us. More than the money, he wants the fruit. And it would be fruit that would remain. It's not just what loose change have I got in my pocket but the fruit that is growing and abiding within each of us or again jumping well into the uh, ends of the New Testament from the book of Titus our people, church people, Christians must also learn in addition to all the good doctrine that we must learn must learn to engage in good deeds why would we do that? Why would we be doing good? In order to meet pressing needs, this is for others, and then for ourselves, so that they will be fruitful. So our giving, our generosity, our kindness, our expressions of the gospel meet the needs of others, other people, particularly other Christians, and we are in that process becoming more and more fruitful ourselves. It's not who gets or how much, but it's the act of letting go and of being generous and relaxing about the things of this world and trusting God that he's got it all in hand. Now, again, smart stewardship results in upward change not just outward change but upward change so um, the apostle says I've received full payment and more because it wasn't about the money thanks for the money but I am amply supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts the financial gifts that you sent and wonderful that it was such a, a generous provision that they made but here's the really interesting bit. How does he describe the money? <coughs> money is described as sacrificial terms, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. This is the upward change. So 
in giving, giving is a core part of worship. In fact, of all the things that we've done today, one of the, perhaps the most worshipful thing you've done is to put money into the offering bag because it's saying, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to let go of something that's important to the world and I'm going to relate to you. And so this is the core of our worship. It's trust. It's it's thanking him for his future provision that we haven't even seen yet. It's well-pleasing to God, not just to give away lots of money, but to trust him in our giving and through our giving and by our giving. And so that's why, here we go back into the wisdom literature, honour the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. And then God will respond to that. But it begins with us honouring the Lord with our wealth. How do we do that? It doesn't say how we do that. There's no one way of just honouring the Lord with your wealth. Partly it will be giving. Partly it will be caring for your nuclear family. Partly it will be caring for us as a church family. Certainly it will be all through that partnership because you're partnering with your family. You're partnering with your church. You're partnering with me because I am the person who gets half of the money that comes in through the offering bag. You're saying to me, give up being a food technologist, give up being a chaplain, come here and we will partner with you to put a roof over your head and food on your table. And you're trusting me to be fair to income about how I use that money. And I'm trusting you. Okay, I'm going to give up a real job and rely on you. This is a partnership that we have, a personal partnership where we need each other. So as God gives us wealth, then we give him honour through our giving, through our caring for one another, through our wise investments so that we've got some future ongoing stream of, of capital coming in that we can honour him and thank him and not be reliant on others. Now, when we come to the last verse, we've got no time to do all this, I'm sorry. Uh, Smart stewardship results in inward change. Very quickly, I want to just hit on three parts of this verse. The inward change. And the first of them is this. My God and your needs. What's the connection between the two? First up, my God will do one thing. Satisfy all your needs. That's number one. That's pretty generous. God will satisfy all your needs. What do you need? Well, you know, I love sailing, but I don't need a 30-foot yacht in order to do it. There are some people who claim to have this um, need to go shopping. I'm not convinced it's actually a need. I don't need a house that's big enough to accommodate the entire population of a third world village. I don't actually need a Lamborghini, though it might be fun to have a drive of one. There's a difference between what the flesh desires and what is a legitimate need. Now, for Stuart, surfs up. What do I really need? Well, there are several things that I, I do need. Security. I need to know that I'm safe from bad things and I have a supply of good things, safety and sufficiency. I have a need for identity, even more than just the basics. This is where it gets to be really interesting. You see, I need to know who I am. I need to know that I am a child of God. And on Father's Day, I need to know that he is the Father who loves and cares and I can trust him. I need to know that I am a soldier in God's army 
and I have a duty and a responsibility to go on the defence to defend you and to go on the offence to bring down the kingdom of darkness. I have a need to understand that I am a sheep, a little lamb in God's flock and he will lead me into green pastures and by still waters. I need to know that I'm a student of God's word and that I can grow and understand and get it when I study what scripture says. I need to know my true identity. I need relationships. Go back to the very early chapters of Genesis. It had God creates and he puts Adam in the Garden of Eden. Perfect man, perfect world, perfect environment, perfect relationship with God and it's God himself who says it's not good. What was not good? It is not good that this person be alone. We are made for relationships, but they've got to be relationships that are healthy relationships, not toxic relationships. Relationships that are with healthy, safe, legitimate, clear boundaries so that we are relating, so that we can love and we can be loved in safe ways. We need that. I need freedom. I need freedom to use my mind. I don't have to be Einstein, but I do have to make choices. And I need to be able to then not just think stuff, but to be able to do stuff, stuff that I've thought through. And I need fulfilment. I need, I'm created in God's image. There is things that I need to be doing to achieve what God has called me to become. You have got a great future still ahead of you. You are in that process of becoming the fullness of Christ in your body, in your circumstances. You need to keep on becoming who you are in the process of becoming. That's God's plan for you. Surf's up. Go s- jump in there. Back to Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. Don't worry saying, oh, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Oh, yeah. The world goes hankering after those things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. They're they're legitimate needs. It's okay to have those. What's the next word? It's but. You, You need those worldly things but. Don't get so lost in those that you miss out on the priority, which is seek first the kingdom of God and seek with that his righteousness. The two are one and the same. And guess what's going to happen? All this other stuff is going to take care of, be taken care of anyway. It's okay to not have the yacht and the Lamborghini. Enough is okay because he's meeting all our needs. Now, here's a great verse. Uh, and we're going to... You know, we, we spend an hour on this, but we're only going to spend... Two minutes, the clock's ticking. 1 Corinthians 16. Look, now, about the collection, here's the principle that is laid down for what we do with our, our offering. Who's the collection for? Once again, it's for God's people. Once again, it's for the saints. It's personal for to sharing within ourselves. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. He's not writing to the Galatians. He's writing to the Corinthians to tell them what the Galatians have been told. And here we're in Philippians and we're getting exactly the same message. This is for everybody. And it's this. On the first day of every week, you've got to lock this in as a plan that I am going to give out of... I'm going to make it a good habit And this is how often it's going to happen. Each one of you, there's no exceptions in this, should set aside a sum of money. It's got to be money. Oh, look, you might have a yard full of pumpkins and God bless you for those, but it's hard to use a pumpkin as currency. Uh, 
don't give the missionaries pumpkins, hoping that they'll do something with it. Turn it. They've got to turn it into cash so they can do something with it. Do the hard work for them. Just give them the cash, a sum of money, in keeping with your income. There's no flat line. There's no fees here. You know, you're not told you've got to give. You, know, you give $10, but you give $100, and you give $500. It's just we each give, and no one... No one knows how much you give. It's between you and Lord because you have decided already in order to become a cheerful giver. But as your means increases, so your ability to give increases and the expectation from God himself is that you will give more as you are more able to give. If your circumstances take, suddenly go pear-shaped, You don't have to keep on giving the same amount. It's not about the money. It's about the fruitfulness and the the wisdom that you've got in using what you've got. I'm racing on. Uh, Still in the same verse. Not only will God satisfy our needs, but I think this is the best line in the whole passage, actually. It's according to his riches in glory. He could... Look... Streets paved with gold. Gates made out of pearl. It's not about the money. He's got it all. And out of that wealth, he is going to... No, no, sorry, that's theologically very unsound. I, I said out of that wealth. Completely wrong. It's according to that wealth. Out of would be a small sample. But according to, it's that's the wealth that he's pouring towards us. He's satisfying our needs according to the fullness of all that he's got. So we read, He who supplies seed to the sower, bread to the food, will also supply and increase your store and enlarge your harvest. You will be enriched in every way. The spiritual takes priority. You get the benefits of that. But there's also practical benefits as well. And then finally, how does it all happen? According to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. All this happens because Jesus has made it possible. And so we also read, I've become the church's servant. What does church servant supposed to do? To present the word of God. And that's what we're supporting. The church's servant presents the word of God in its fullness. A mystery that's been kept hidden for centuries. The Old Testament people didn't know about this. But it's now disclosed to the Lord's people to whom God has chosen to make known make known the glorious riches of this mystery. The riches are in the, the secret that's been kept hidden. And what is it? What, what's the richest thing that could possibly happen? It's this. Read it out loud. It's Christ in you that makes the difference. That's your real wealth. With Christ within, then everything else starts to fall into place. Put him in the priority. Put him in the centre. Everything else begins to work. You know, as someone once said, I think I heard maybe in a sermon recently, Christ died for me so that he could live in me. And now Christ lives in me so that he can live through me. The one who gave up the wealth of heaven to become poor so that I could become rich and out of that richness be generous as he himself has been. Let me pray for us. Our Father, thank you for the the vastness of the wealth that you hold in heaven's store. But thank you too for the wealth that we have. In this nation and in this time, we possess so much more than 90% of the world could even imagine they could have. But we are blessed in a material sense. Thank you for that. It's out of your grace alone and we are the recipients of it. So, 
for what we have received, O Lord, we are truly thankful. But help us now to be wise with what we have, to be generous with what we have, and to partner in our giving so that it's a joyful thing, a cheerful thing to be able to give knowing that the gospel is making inroads into the world. So thank you for all you've given us already and for what you're going to do through our giving and through our fruitful lives. In Jesus' name, amen.